I don't think he got the exaggeration gene. He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't have much big shot itis. <laughs> Let's see what else he doesn't have. But his mother must have been one heck of a woman. And she is. Uh, Got to keep her alive, too. Got to get her on the vitamins and the minerals. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, Ginny, what did your husband think of this? I mean, your son think of this. Oh, I think he's inspired. Really? Yeah, he likes all of you. That's what we're going to hear. This is very, very exciting news. So we're going to bring Scott back up. Uh, come on up here and sit next to me, Scott. And we want you to, what we're going to do is try to wrap a bow around everything you saw. If you've got, anybody's got any questions online and want to ask Scott or myself or any of the female ambassadors or anybody else in the room, you're welcome to do it. But uh, is there anything that looks like a question out there? Not yet. But what we've got to do is make sure, here's what I know for a fact. This worked for me. But that doesn't mean anything. It worked for Scott. That doesn't mean anything. What means something is that it works for you. And that every one of you in this room and every one of you watching this thing know that you can do this. <clears throat> and one thing that I make real sure about me is that you realize that I am, you know, then he's hit the nail on the head. If Tom can do it, I can do it. I, this has got to be duplicatable at the lowest common denominator. And I am the lowest common denominator. That's what I love about me. There is nothing, I mean, there is nothing that I tell you that you can Google. Because everything I've got is complete and 100% part knowledge. Scott is a mixture of both. He is an unbelievable human being, but he's also got the skills. I read this profession constantly, trying to get it to a point where I can teach you what I somehow learned a long time ago, but this guy's done it. So ask him questions, or Scott, you just come with some perspective about what you've seen today, looking at this crowd, because he told me when I sat down with him, he says, There's, we have just got to get these people to understand that they can do it. And that's what we have to have you understand, is that each and every one of you can do this. Together, we are one giant one. That even includes you, James. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. How are we really like fortunate, privileged, blessed, honored? It, it, it's amazing to me. You know, you look around and you see the talent, the skill, the heart, and soul of this company, and then I'm like, we get to be part of it. We're here. Mm -hmm. We're not out there somewhere like, oh, I wish I was on the inside of that camp, or wouldn't it be cool to be them, or they're so fortunate, they're so lucky. I mean, we're we're here. And I think it's also cool that you can choose in. If you find yourself on the outside, you can choose in. And I love that too. So uh, Adrian, thanks so much for uh, what you shared. I think you've just, uh, you, you've summed it up so well yeah. about how you, you've you been raised in this environment. And you could have easily taken it for granted. Oh, oh that's, that's, that's my dad's thing, or um, that's just what he does. But I love the fact that you, you observed it because you got a really analytical mind. You observed it, and you were able to package all that and put it into a perspective that's really useful for people. And I really appreciate uh, that about you, Adrian. It's, it's really, really powerful. So do you appreciate what he yeah. had to share? Yeah. yeah. And Denise, thank you for what you shared. Juliet, thank you for what you shared. Tom, thank you for what you shared. You're it's, it's, it's so valuable, it's just great. So I'm back back there like the rest of you, just taking it in and nodding and shaking my head and being in this moment and taking notes on my phone. And uh, you know, I, I go back and I digest this stuff. I don't take for granted what was prepared to be shared today. I go back and I digest it. I look through my notes and I, I relive these moments and, I, and then I put it into perspective of what's useful for me. How can I take that information and apply it now? And, and for what purpose? You can get a result. If, if it's not about results, what does it matter? Don't you want results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. I want results. So the other day I had the privilege of being interviewed by uh, Richard Brooke. He's the author, as Tom mentioned, of this four-year career. And it's such an honor to be in that book, to be asked to be in someone's book, to be interviewed in a segment. I, I don't. I think his segment is called Heroes in Network Marketing or something like that. And it was over an hour-long interview. 
And um, he said, I want to talk about your results. Because he said, what, what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to compile interviews from different people that have done something in network marketing and figure out what they all had that was similar. Like, what's the common denominator for the people that achieve a result inside of network marketing? What's the common theme? What's the denominator? And, and then he said, what I want to do is I want to show everyone that after we find the common denominator, how do you calculate that and show what happens in the four-year career? So the title of the book is The Four-Year Career. So it's really a compilation of experiences and common denominators that equal this four-year career. What can you expect? How can you calculate that? I said, sure, I can go with that. So he said, I want to ask you and Juliet. She wasn't here, by the way. She would have been in this interview. She was on a, a women's cruise at the time. And so he said, I, I want to ask you about specifics, results, facts about your business. He said, so if I could, let's dive into that. I said, sure, whatever you want to know. He goes, well, when you said yes to longevity, he goes, I know you had some health condition and your mind wasn't really thinking about business at the time, but when you got past all that, and when you were looking at, okay, that's in the rear view mirror now, now you've made this decision to build a business, how many people did you sponsor, enroll, introduce, influence to come to longevity? And I said, after 90 days, it's about 30 people. And he goes, wow, that's really interesting. That's, that's really cool. And so he said, what about after two years? After two years, how many people do you think you inspired, influenced, sponsored, enrolled into Longevity? And I said, about 150 people. And he goes, wow. So he said, let's think about that for a second. So in the first 90 days, you were inspiring, influencing, motivating, encouraging, sponsoring, enrolling one person about every three days. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the math. And so, by the way, that's, that's on average. So some days, nothing happens. You cultivate, you dig, you inspire, you influence, nothing happens. And the next day, you do the same thing. Maybe that third day, something you did the first two days bit and culminated into someone taking action. So that's the way you look at it. After two years, though, you know, somewhere around 150 people, he said, now I want you to tell the audience, what did that result in after four years your four-year career how did that work out for you and i said it worked out pretty well you know mm -hmm. we did all these things consistently over this four-year career we planted all these seeds in the beginning we harvested them we took care of them we nurtured them we duplicated other people doing similar activity and after four years we had over 150,000 people in our organization from those 150. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. So 150,000 people turned into all kinds of things. Tom said some nice things about us when he was introducing us, or, or me and Juliet, to come up here and share today. And you know, we were, you know, rookies of the year in our first year in the business. We were um, trainers of the year, our second year in the business. We did have circle of excellence in that second or third year of business. In the third or fourth year of our business, we reached, at, at the time, there's, there's some new positions now, at the time, we reached the highest possible accomplishment inside of longevity in just that first three years of our existence into our four-year career. And since then, we've received the presidential award, which is, you know, one person in the world gets that. It's given out by the CEO, and Juliet and I received that award as well. So. Why do I share this with you? It's, it's not to impress you. We're already part of the same family. I, I think we're, we're all impressed with each other. With the neighbor beside you, we can all find a reason to be press, impressed with each other. What I'm doing is I'm impressing upon you what happens when you develop the right mindset, when you have the right belief, when you have the right attitude, when you have the right mentality, and understand the philosophy of what we're really doing here, then the results for us are not I don't, I don't think they're special. I don't think it's because we have a certain last name or we have certain first names or we have a certain look or appeal or appearance. Um, what I think it has more to do with is your desire, something that's inside here. It's, it's your desire to have that result or outcome. You being willing to go through the motions and through the actions to have that kind of a result. It's a belief that you have and it's a decision that you get to make like, like everybody else. And, and some of you are, are looking at me like deer in headlights right now, and some of you are like totally getting, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. I, I believe all that. And, and so I, I don't know what it is for you, but I do know this. There is a switch inside of you 
you can flip it, you control the switch, you can turn it on or you can turn it off, and you can you can either choose to believe what I'm saying right now, or you can say that's you know, completely hogwash. Let me give you an example. We were not the prettiest kids on the block when we came to Young Debbie. I want everyone here to know that. And I spend a lot more time telling people about our shortcomings and our faults and the ugly side of who we are than look at what you see today. You see something pretty and polished today, for the most part. We've got flaws, and if you look a little closely, there's some, there's some ugly cracks about us as people, because we're, we're sinners. We make mistakes all the time. But I do want you to know this. When we came to Longevity, when I say we weren't pretty, we were not pretty. We weren't pretty to look at. We weren't pretty to be around. We, were, we had a lot of issues going on. We, we didn't have two nickels to rub to our name when we said yes to Longevity. Um, not a lot of people knew that because we didn't wear it all on the outside. We, we were at least wise enough, educated enough to know that it's not attractive <laughs> to go around looking and acting like a victim. But the truth is, if you looked under the covers and saw what was there, those were just the facts of our circumstances. We weren't blasting that to the world. We weren't making some announcement for us. And if you only had our deck of cards, you'd understand why we're such miserable human beings. That wasn't our message. We went around acting and looking like we wanted a change in our life. That, that was the appeal. And I think that's what, what Tom and Denise saw in us was, was a couple of people that had a, a few marbles messed up at the moment, but we wanted a change. We, we didn't want to be in that position. We were looking for an exit strategy, an escape, a vehicle to take us from point A to point B. And, and I'm so thankful to some wonderful people in our life at, at the time that we were going through this struggle. Um, you know, not in any order. I, I was miserable with physical ailments and health issues and taking painkillers and, and all kinds of things going on. You know, you take, you take that into consideration and suddenly it, it's like you don't have the ability to perform certain ways. You're not impressive to certain people. Going out and performing at a job may, might be a difficult circumstance. We had a car repossessed. Uh, I never forget waking up and, and hearing the motor of the, of the repo truck, you know, wrenching that you know, vehicle up with a winch onto the back of a flatbed truck and, and at 4 a.m. knowing that that was going down, we were never going to see it again. Now what? How do we get, how do we get our things done? Um, you know, another car was, we paid like 400 bucks for it. It was some beat up jalopy that somebody had sitting around and it started. It was like, I'll, I'll take it, 400 bucks. And it was embarrassing because we had this big old piece of cardboard that we had to keep in the back seat. And when we park it, we'd have to pull out the cardboard and put it under the engine transfer case in the axle because all the oil engine or the oil from the engine was leaking out onto the ground. And could you imagine parking in someone's nice driveway? You back out and it's like, here's this big old oil stain. Oh, it's horrible. You know, I, I wanted to park it down the street for all appointments and then and then just walk to where I had to go so nobody could judge me for that car. But I'll tell you what, those things were all gifts. I didn't, I didn't realize it at the time. The best thing that ever could have happened to us in that moment was to understand the gift of desperation, to understand the gift of humility, because now I have the ability. It's a gift now. I can relate to other people. I have passion for other people. I have concern and care and, and compassion or that empathy and sympathy. You know those things? Um, they're really powerful tools. And before, maybe I wasn't that guy. Maybe I didn't have the right heart or the ability to say, I understand your circumstance and I can relate to where you're coming from. Now I can do that. Before I was probably the tougher skin guy that said, oh, you know, build a bridge, hire an architect like Steve and, and get over it. And, uh, <laughs> not, it's, it's better on the other side. Well, now it's like, okay, I understand. I get it. Let me tell you what I experienced. Here's, what, here's how I felt in that similar situation. Here's what I learned, and here's what I found. And, you know, it's the feel, felt, found concept. And there, that's a pretty powerful concept is to be, able to, to, to be able to do that with another human being. Our car got repossessed. After we started, do, our, I'm sorry, our house got foreclosed on. Our house got foreclosed on. The place that has the four walls with the roof over your head, the, the place where you got all your furniture and your things and your assets that you've collected your whole life that you think are important, ours were inside those four walls. And our house was being foreclosed on. All at the same time, we were thinking about starting this longevity business. I'll never forget the first few meetings that we were doing. 
I haven't gone around blasting this, but we're all amongst friends and family, and I know you are online as well. So I'll, re I'll reveal this. When you make a decision, you know in that moment nothing is going to stop you. Nothing. It's the ultimate hope. You know you're doing the right thing. You know you're associated with the right people. You know you're in the right company. You just commit, you decide, and you go all in. And I remember having some people over to our home to show the plan. And, and people ask me all the time, how'd you do that? I mean, didn't you feel like a fake? Didn't you feel like a fraud? Didn't you feel like you were, you know, telling people things that you couldn't prove yourself or even demonstrate? You weren't this poster child success story. How could you get up there and talk to people about success? And I said, because I knew from counsel and wisdom and other people that had gone before me that you should never confuse the message with the messenger. I was simply a messenger. I wasn't necessarily the message. It was never about me. Don't I have the right to be the conduit? Can't I lead people from point A without being the ultimate success story? Can I not inspire people and say, here's what I've seen, come and see for yourself, couldn't I do that? And we did. We became like this movie called, you know, the body snatchers and draggers. And, and that's what we did. And, and one night, I remember we were in our, our home, and we had invited some people over into, yes, our foreclosed house. We hadn't been kicked out yet. And so we thought, well, it's a space. <laughs> and it doesn't cost us any money to invite people over here. So we did. And we had people into our home, and I don't know, 15, 16, 17 people were huddled up in our family room. And I remember standing in front of the room, and I was telling a story about longevity. Remember Denise talked about the power of stories? And so I was just telling a story. I was talking about, you know, what we were looking forward to and that we have been through some challenges and here's what we found. And the doorbell rang. Juliet gets up, she goes and answers the door and I just, I just, I had this feeling. I had this feeling that every time the phone rang, that it was like, oh, it's, you know, it's probably a bill collector. Oh. You have me on a time, line, a time zone right now? Like for real? Oh. You guys want me on a time zone right now? No. <laughs> Am I on a time zone? We gotta do raffle and we gotta hear about one o'clock. You guys don't care about raffles, just give it all away. Just do 36 minutes. Time's up, guys. Thank, thank you. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> do we have to do a raffle. Um, okay, so the doorbell rang, and it was in that time period when I'm thinking, good night. I, I didn't want to talk. To, I, I didn't want to think about those people. I had a job to do, and it was called save my life and save my family. That was my job. And so I cringed. The doorbell rang, and I thought, this probably isn't good. And sure enough, Juliet comes back from the, you know, the, the front door area, and she just kind of, you know, gives me one of these, and it's like, Seriously, in the middle of the meeting, I gotta like walk away from the front of the room? Okay, so I called somebody up and said, you know, do something, entertain, take over. And uh, so that happened, I went to the front door and there's two people with badges. And you know, they're you know doing this and, and showing the badge, we're credentialed, and you've been served. And it was that ultimate notice, like you gotta move out of your house and you, you've been served, this is it. And so the, the, the feeling of shame, guilt, condemnation, failure, you know, the neon lights, you're not good enough, you know, how, you, you're, you're terrible, all that stuff goes through your mind. And, and, and you know what? I looked at Juliet, you know, we closed the door, they were gone, papers are in our hands. There's a room full of people right around the corner in the family room. They can't see us. We're, we're away from them for the moment. And they're talking and they're excited. And I looked at Juliet and I said, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. This is just temporary. It's just stuff. It doesn't mean anything in the big picture of life. It just doesn't. This is not what matters. Let's go back in there. Let's put on the game face. So we have this thing. It started with our daughter. But, you know, it's like. You look at each other, you get serious, and you just do that. That's our little symbol. Whenever, whenever we tell each other it's game time, this is our family code. We look at each other and just go like that. You know what that is? It's eye black. Mm -hmm. That's what the pros do. You know, they in the locker room when they're getting ready for game time. Why do they do that? Because there's bright lights out there, and they're distracting. 
and see you've all got skin right here it's a cheekbone and when the bright lights angle off your cheekbone if you've ever played sports grade school high school baseball kc you ever played played sports you remember eye black my kids wore it they go out on the baseball diamond hot sunny day summer baseball tournaments you put on the eye black and so when you're serious and you don't want to get distracted and you don't want <laughs> things reflecting into your eyes so you cannot see you put on the eye black see how that works and it's just like life you got to put on the eye black so you do this that's the code Everybody do this. Take your two fingers and just put them on your cheekbones starting at your nose and just make that motion right there. Okay? Doesn't that feel good? Mm -hmm. It feels good. It's like protection. It's safety. You're prepared. Now you go back out there and things that don't matter. The bill collector. I'm not saying it doesn't. It's not happening. But you know what? You've got to not sit around and go, I can't pay my bills. You've got to say, I'm struggling in this moment to pay my bills, and doggone it, I'm not going to get distracted from the action I need to take, the things I need to do in this moment, and so it's game on. Let's get this done. Mm -hmm. And so Juliet and I did the old deal, and we walked back in there as if nothing happened. And you know what? Now you wonder, how did you influence, inspire, and motivate 30 people in your first 90 days to come into Young Well, I'll tell you what. That's what. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to close you out with a story. That was a story. <laughs> I'm going to tell you another story. A bunch of little bedtime stories. Yeah. Yeah. Was that lesson helpful, by the way? Yeah. Yes. No. Tell about Lewis's car that day at the opportunity first. Yeah. So, my, Lewis, I hope you're listening. I hope you watch the replay of this. Dr. Lewis. Great friends of mine and Juliet's, Tom and Denise's, they're ambassadors in longevity. We've all got our war stories. We've all got them. You think that these people just all of a sudden, poof, they got lucky? There was never luck involved in becoming an ambassador in longevity. Never was there luck. Please let me repeat that. There was never luck in achieving any level of success in this company. You think it was luck? Think again. It started with a coffee shop interview. It started with, with a conversation. It started, like Denise pointed out, with, with Nikki, getting real with somebody and finding out how I could love more on that person, how I could serve more on that person, how I could take the time to make a difference in that person's world. That takes work. It takes intentionality. It takes listening skills. It takes social skills. You got to wrap all that together. That takes some time and some education and some practice. Once you learn it, though, and you practice it, yeah. it's game on. Come on, let's do this. And so, um, yeah, that, that's, that's how it happens. But Lewis was doing an opportunity meeting. He was just getting started in Young As a matter of fact, I think within like three months of each other or so, we got started in Young at the exact same time. You know what's interesting? We just kind of followed each other's success paths. We, we, we jockey back and forth with each other constantly inside of Young Jelly. They're great running mates. Great. I think we inspire each other, quite frankly. And so he was t telling a story about how he was sitting in a restaurant. Times were tough for him. I'm not mistaken. I got the story right. They had just like closed down seven chiropractic centers. They were transitioning into network marketing as their solution to other challenges in their life. And here he is in a restaurant doing an interview, a coffee shop interview, a restaurant interview, a social interview, and he's getting to know somebody across the table, and they're like, okay, this is great, makes sense, we're gonna team up with you, we're gonna do this business with you, let's go, let's do this. And he's like, okay, great, and he helped that person get started. He goes, okay, I'll see you later, here's when we're gonna get together, here's our follow-up, and he goes and walks outside the door, and it's like, <laughs> I could have sworn I parked right here <laughs> i could have sworn i parked right here and he's looking around and he's like hmm dang it i think my car just got repossessed <laughs> and so he had to go hunt down his new enrollee his brand new person his brand new prospect and say can i get a ride home <laughs> i mean come on that's like the ultimate story is it not i mean i mean it, it's great you know what's great about that story is everything it's true for starters <laughs> and you love to hear true stories like that really happened yeah that really happened 
And, and secondly, it's like, okay, I found myself making all these excuses for why it's not my turn or why this couldn't work for me. However, usually the things that we drum up pale in comparison to the true stories of other people that have gone before us. Does this make sense? So you, you get to remind yourself, okay, game on. If other people can do this, I can do this too. What's my excuse? What's my problem? And so that, that's awesome. And then um, what I wanted to leave you with is, uh, you know, several years ago, myself and a couple other guys, we put together a group at, um, it was through our church and we decided to do like this, this men's hike. And here's how the conversation started. It was like, hey, we're gonna get a group of guys together and we're gonna go summit Long's Peak and watch the sunrise. Okay, survey. How many of you would like to do that? How many of you think that would be really cool? Raise your hand if you're like, man, that'd be awesome. That's really cool. Keep your hands up, hold on. Okay. Now, that is a... That's a, you were there. That's why I didn't rise my Yes. So I'm looking, I'm looking at someone on the front row named Steve Blackburn. He was part of this story, and I want you to know, he did not just raise his hand. <laughs> This is part of the story. There's a reason for this. There's a reason why Steve is not raising his hand, and he was there, and he was actually a success story inside of this story. Yes? Okay. And he's like, yeah, it depends on how you define success. So, so you came back it started out, so check this out. It started out, and, and the word was spreading. Hey, there's this group of guys. They're going to go Summit Long's Peak, and they're going to watch the sunrise. And the word started filtering around and everybody wanted to go. And then we're like, you know what? From experience, this is not going to work out so well. You cannot take everybody who thinks it's cool to see the sunrise from the summit of Long's Peak up a huge mountain called 14,256 feet at some crazy hour of the day or night and think that that's going to work out well. So we started putting out the word, if you really want to go, it's going to be hard. Boom, instantly 50% of the hands went back down and the group pared down from 100 people that wanted to go to like 50. And then as we got closer, we started spreading the word, it's gonna be really hard. And then <laughs> the 50 people went to 25. And it stuck at about 25, I think there was 23 people at the end that were like, hey, we're in, this sounds like a great idea. And so we said, okay, we're going to have a meeting so everybody knows for sure what they're going to get into. And we said, it's going to be really hard. You know, we got to leave at this time. It's going to take us 24 hours round trip, and we're probably not going to stop long at all. We got to just keep moving. And, you know, you're going to be cold, and you're going to be hungry, and you're going to be tired. Your feet are going to hurt. You got to think, and you got to be prepared. Here's the list of things you need to bring to be responsible. You got to have a buddy. You got to have a buddy with you, and it's an all for nothing. If you cannot make it at any part in the journey, and you're convinced that you can go no further, your buddy has to quit too. Nobody will ever be left alone. This was, we set up the rules. I mean, this was pretty specific. So we decide, okay, let's get this thing on. So the date came, here we go. We start, we left in the middle of the day, like mid mornings. We started at this trailhead and it, we took, we took the long way. And if you ever been from, um, like, uh, I already forget the name of the falls. Anyhow, uh, Bear Lake trailhead area, Bear Lake trailhead. So if you go from that spot, and you go all the way up through Black Lake, it's five and a half miles just to get to Black Lake. And that's not even the hard part. That's just to like the base area before it starts getting hard. That's just like a walk in the park, a couple thousand feet elevation gain and then straight up. So Steve remembers. So we all get up into Black Lake and it's like, okay, cool. You know, we're gonna wait to summit under a full moon and we'll hang out here for a little bit, take a little nap, take a load off. We'll go fishing, cook up some dinner, get some protein in our bodies and then we'll hang we'll wait a couple hours and then go for it so we did all that and then here came a serious yes yes he said yes yes serious thunderstorm so no. thunder is one thing but you know what precedes thunder lightning. lightning and when you're up at that high altitude you're like in it so here came the clouds just <clears throat> 
just rained right down in us. It started pouring rain like you couldn't believe. And this is when all these big burly men started weeping. And so you saw men go to mice. It was like, oh, what are we going to do now? This is horrible. And they were like, okay, you know, this, this is part of the equation. We said this was going to be hard. And, and, and lightning just started striking like closer than the proximity of in this room. That's a pretty small lightning, boom, right there. And we're, you know, some of us are freaking out. I was kind of freaking out, actually. It was pretty intense. And you talk about loud, louder than seven peals of thunder, just, and then you're in this bowl with all these big, huge mountain peaks, and it would strike once, of course, and then there'd be a big, an instantaneous boom. It was like flash of lightning, boom, louder than you could even imagine. And then bouncing all off the canyons, you had to hear the same boom like seven times. Wow. And so, and then another peel would hit before that boom ended. It was like this this orchestra of you know percussion instruments that are just going off. And so, what do you do? You know, I had hair at the time. <laughs> Everybody asked me, "How'd you lose all your hair?" Well, I was on this hike one time, and and no, literally, I had all my hair was standing on end, like straight up. And and other people, same thing. It, it was just amazing. If you had arm hairs, they were up on end. That's how intense it was. So that all passes. We start up, you know, the backside of Long's Peak, and it is steep. And now we're going through the night and all that moisture that came in, it's now just snowing on us. So here comes the snow. It's slippery, the rocks are treacherous. You know, it's so steep, we're like scaling, like hand and feet together up this backside. And the 23 turned into 13. I don't want to joke. 13. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody at the top of the pack that was up front, they got up far enough and they dislodged the boulder, like a big boulder, and here it came, and we're all looking at this boulder come crashing down and sparks are flying, and I mean, people, they just barely got out of the way and that thing just goes flying past, like, man, if someone got taken out, I mean, they'd be, be killed. If you got hit by that rock, yeah. you could definitely be killed and just wiped out. We're like, man, we are like defying a lot of things right now. This is like life and death, and we survived. You know what, we survived. We made it to the top. 13 people out of the original 23, who didn't make it? It was interesting. The people that didn't make it were sometimes the ones that were the most boisterous on the front side. Like, oh, this is going to be a walk in the park. Let's get it on in. Come on. You know, they had no preparation, no forethought about the intensity of this, no planning, no preparedness. And those were usually the people that ended up dropping off. We get, did get up. We did see the sunrise. It was amazing. Steve was there. We took pictures. Some people puked on the top. It's okay. <laughs> I made it anyways. And here's the moral of the story in conclusion. This is hard. We're telling you it's hard. We're not like keeping this a secret. But you know why you're going to make it? You're going to make it because we're preparing you. You're going to see that sunrise in Longevity, and you will make it to the summit up there of 14,256 on peak Longevity. You're going to get there, but you won't get there by accident. You're not going to get there because you stumbled into it. You're going to get there because there is planning, and there's preparation, and there's coming together, and there's team meetings. Why are you going to make it? Because you come to Super Saturday. Why are you going to make it? Because you participate in the weekly meetings. Why are you going to make it? Because you stay plugged into the weekly Zoom conference calls. Why are you going to make it? Because you're going to register for Leadership Mastery on June 6 and 7 and 8. Why are you going to make it? Because you're going to go to convention. The people that don't make it get so big for their britches that they think all of a sudden they've just got it all figured out and they can march to the beat of their own drum and pull this off themselves. Why will you make it? Because you're going to take the skills that you learned today. You're going to get a little tougher and thicker skin. You're going to go apply yourself. You're going to listen the way Denise taught. You're going to get some mojo the way Juliet talked. You're going to, you're going to have uh, conversations with people the way that Adrian shared with you. You're going to have heart like Tom talks about. And you're going to practice over and over and over. And then you're going to have this tipping point. And there's a book called The Tipping Point. You're going to have a tipping point when you're going to go, aha. I've been doing, doing, the, doing this stuff, and finally it's like over the brim you go, and everything you've been doing just starts to percolate and bubble and spill over. And that's your tipping point. 
And that's going to happen because your belief and all this practice goes into a place to where you will start having conversations and relating and socializing with other people. And you're not going to be a mouse anymore. You're going to believe that what you have, in fact, is the ultimate solution for people. And you're not going to be held back. You're going to make invitations. And you're going to start thinking about, okay, if this is an events-driven thing, remember I said you're going to make it because you engage in certain things and you take people with you to the engagement process. So this is an event to an event to an event culture, period. You can go to all the events that you want to, but the day you start realizing there's an event coming up, I should have some foresight on that. If this is all about believability to bring people to events, then I should probably um, promote for that next event, right? And when you start promoting for the next event and you start bringing people with you to those next events, everyone I've ever taken to an event are the people that stick around. Mm -hmm. We take people to events. End of story, period. There's nothing more sacred than the really good events. Which ones? The next one coming up. Mm -hmm. Some of you are like, oh, I can't wait to go to convention. Oh, that's really great. I'll tell you right now, you're going to go by yourself to convention because there were six, seven, eight other things between this date and that date that are coming up and you needed the leapfrog event from all the little things that lead to the big thing. Does this make sense, everybody? Mm -hmm. You can't just skip, 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 skip. Oh, I'm going to go to convention. Great. There were all these little pebble and stepping stones in between. You should be building for those and putting people in front of information on all of those stepping stones so you're constantly leaping, frog, leapfrogging forward with more people and more people and more people. And the bigger you get, the bigger you get and the faster you get bigger. That's how this business works, in my opinion. So I hope that was helpful today. And I hope those stories and those visuals are able to be thought about later on. You might forget some of the content. You won't forget the, that story, though, or those couple stories I shared with you and how those apply to your business. So thank you so much, and have a great day.